guys, welcome back to my channel. Today we're gonna do something that I have never done before, and that is a Q&A. Before we get into that, let me show you my sweatshirt. I, have I worn this before? It says, you are the sassiest sloth I have ever seen. Congratulations, Gold Star. It's one of my favorite stupid sweatshirts that I bought. So yeah, we're gonna do a Q&A, and actually, I was kind of, I asked you guys what I should do to celebrate hitting a thousand subscribers, and overwhelmingly people said Q&A. Some people said, uh, like, do your boyfriend's nails or something. He will never come on this camera. I can tell you right now, I can count on both hands. We've been together for eight, a little over eight years at this point. Um, I've known him since 2010. There are less than 10 photographs of us together, I'm pretty sure. He hates the camera. He does not like to be photographed. He does not like to be filmed. So unfortunately that won't happen <laughs> also his nails are disgusting so you guys don't want to see that um but yeah so i because i got mostly q a that's what we're gonna do i was kind of nervous when i posted to instagram and then uh, my community tab when i initially asked for questions like in the first couple hours nobody posted anything and i was like oh i'm gonna throw up like people actually don't care this is embarrassing i've embarrassed myself but then I got a lot of questions that rolled in, especially on the community tab. So we're just gonna kind of go through everything. I copied and pasted everything onto a document and I'm just gonna be reading them off my phone and answering them. Um, I know it's kind of annoying when YouTubers read off their phone, but well, I don't have a printer. I can't like print out a sheet of paper and be like, here we go. So we're just gonna read them right off the phone and I will try to timestamp them if there's not too many, but there seems to be kind of a lot, so we'll see. So yeah, let's hop right in. So number one is, what is your day job? I work in the automotive industry. I don't know why, I don't know anything about cars. <laughs> I work in an office. My job title is specifically an operations coordinator. If you asked me to define that, I could not do it. I don't know, I just do what I'm told. <laughs> They're like, Hillary, will you do this? Will you do that? And I'm like, I guess. Yeah, I can do that. Um, basically, my my main focus of my job is just making sure, because um, we're a supplier, we supply uh, electronic car parts, and I just make sure that we have enough on hand to meet the forecasted quantities from each customer. I make sure that shipments go out on time. I let the customers know that the shipments are coming even though they ordered it so they should know it's coming, just saying. Um, but yeah, it's not an exciting job. It's not like fun, but it's also not hard and it pays me enough that I can buy all the nail polish I want. So not too worried about it. What job does your boyfriend have? He also, works in the automotive industry. Um, I work for a Japanese company specifically. Like, I I honestly don't care what I do as long as I work for some sort of Japanese outfitter just because my major was in like Japanese language. So I wanna be able to utilize that where I can. My boyfriend, however, is Korean. And so he works for a Korean car company or automotive industry. He works more on the warehouse side of things, even though he technically has an office job. He works in the warehouse. I actually don't know his official title. I don't even think he knows his official title. He just, again, a lot of things when you work in an office, I feel like you just go in and you do what they say. So, cause like no two offices are the same. Like if I had the same title, like at my last job, I worked in sales and I knew what my duties were there. And at my new office, the sales team, they do things completely different. So I just feel like it's kind of an office to office basis. But yeah, he also works in the automotive industry, but he works for like Korean cars. What made you want to start your YouTube channel? This is kind of weird because it was like, I, it was probably five months into like the initial quarantine period. And um, I had been working from home for those five months and just watching a ton of YouTube. Like I would be on my laptop doing my job and then in in front of me was our TV and I would just have YouTube videos playing constantly. And I was heavy into nail polish at that time, like heavier than usual or up to that point because I had nothing to do and nowhere to go. And so I was just like, let me just paint my nails all the time. And I was watching a lot of nail content too. 
And then I got laid off and I was like, well, I'll just make a video. I don't know what prompted me to do that because I don't really post to social media. I haven't posted on Facebook in years. I, I tweet here and there. My personal Instagram, I think the last time I posted a picture was months ago. The only thing I post over there is anytime I see a cool bug. So, but I just, I don't know. I was like, let me just film this and see if I can do it. And I did it and I posted it. And it, I think it was like my fall nail polish pics of 2020. And I was surprised. I think it, it only got like a few views and a couple comments, but I was like, oh, cool. That was interesting. And so I just kept doing it and doing it. And then I got my current job and I just kept posting anyways, because by that point I started to see the same people commenting and liking my videos and things like that. And it was a real confidence booster in a weird way. Um, so yeah, I just, it was, I got laid off from my job and then I was like, well, I should film a video, which was really out of character for me. And it has exploded into something I never really expected to happen. And I, it's been a lot of fun. Um, okay, I got this question twice, actually. What is the oldest polish in your collection? I actually did a whole video on this. I will link it up in the cards. But I think we decided it was the Sally Hansen Nail Chromes or Nail Makeup. Hang on. So yeah, it was one of these, I'm pretty sure. These, I have like 30 or so in my collection that I got from a D-Stash. Uh, this one, I think, is like one of the older ones. I have some from 2002, but then this one is from 2001. So the oldest polish in my collection is 21 years old. I was eight years old when this polish came out. So I didn't buy this specifically. Um, like I said, I got it in a D-Stash. Uh, I think that if you tried to put nail polish on me when I was eight, I would have run away screaming. So, but yeah, this is, this has to be the oldest one. And these are... They come in these bottles that make them look like they're gel, but they're not. Kind of weird. Oh, oh, that one stinks. That smells, that smells really bad. The next one is, what is your favorite mainstream brand? And that would have to be China Glaze. I think I've said this a few times, but I just feel like even though the quality is not always there for China Glaze, I, I will admit that openly, I think that they are the most consistently innovative of all all the mainstream brands that I'm familiar with. They are always collaborating with really fun IPs. They are always releasing a lot of different finishes together and things like that. Uh, you know, they do have their plain cream or mostly cream collections. They have a lot of good creams as well, but they just do a lot of interesting stuff. And I think the thing that really, really sold me on China Glaze specifically was the Paint It Black collection from several Halloweens ago, where they released a six piece monochrome collection. It was all black, all of them had different finishes. And I know that's not a new concept, but it was to me at that time. And then ever since then, I've just noticed they do a lot of crazy stuff. And while other mainstream brands have done, you know, wilder finishes or interesting things, they are not consistent about it. They're not always doing it. They're not always taking risks in the same way that China Glaze is. And so that's why I really like them. Okay, I liked this question. This one was specifically from Polish with Ray. Um, you have such interesting hobbies, nail polish, bugs, Star Trek, any other intense interest? I gotta say, I like that you framed it as an intense interest because in my family, we don't have hobbies, we have hyperfixations. So yeah, I actually, I have a lot of hobbies. I mean, you guys know, like she said, nail polish, bugs, Star Trek. Um, I have a couple kind of what some people would call like old lady-ish hobbies. I used to knit a ton. Um, I haven't recently because I've been focused more on my cross stitching. <laughs> so let me let me show you what I'm working on right now. So I have two kind of hyper fixations in, in one here. I love cross stitching. I taught myself to cross stitch my freshman year of college because bringing all the knitting supplies with me would have been a lot. So I decided to go on YouTube and learn a new skill. And ever since then, you know, I was... 17 when I started college and ever I'm 29 now. So I've been cross stitching for a long time, been knitting since I was 11. And I'm also obsessed with the X-Files. So let me zoom back. 
This is something I've been working on for a while. This is the poster that hung in Mulder's office. At the bottom of it, it says, I want to believe, which <laughs> I have tattooed on my leg. I, I was obsessed with this poster when I was a kid. My dad was the one who introduced me to the X-Files. Um, I remember, I think I was like early middle school and he was like, hey, Hillary, do you want to come watch something with me? And he took me to the TV room and he put it on and I was like, eyes glued, transfixed on this. And um, ever since then, that was kind of our thing. We watched the X-Files together. We always talk about it, even though it's like, how much can you, the show is over. How much can you talk about it? But we do, we love it. Um, and I was obsessed with this poster and I wanted it so bad and I never bought it. I don't know why. And instead I decided to find a 63,000 stitch cross stitch and cross stitch it, which it would have been cheaper to just buy the poster. <laughs> But yeah, so that's what I'm working on right now. My goal is to finish that by the end of the year. Um, other than that, man, I have so many hobbies. Like, it's hard to keep up. But that's kind of the one that I'm focused on right now is cross-stitching and the X-Files. Because we're actually re-watching the X-Files for probably the millionth time. <laughs> what are the top three most used polishes not including base or top coat? So number one, I can tell you is Essie's Chin Chili because that is one that I have used up and repurchased. That's the only polish I've ever fully used up and then bought again to use again. So that is one of them. My current bottle is pretty high because I haven't worn it in a while, but yeah, I, I use that one to death. Um, what else? Zoya's Jill because that was my job interview color. And when I moved back to the States from Japan, I was doing a lot of job interviews to try to find something that I wanted to do. And so that was always, I would take off whatever I was wearing and I would put on Jill before my job interview. And I think I've got maybe like two fifths of the bottle left. So I've gone through most of that. It's weird, none of them are really all that exciting. You know what? The other one I did show you guys was, uh, the other day in my purples video, was the Studio M Polish Vintage Vamp. I think that one probably has the most significant fill line on any of my other polishes. And uh, like, I am not counting blacks and whites in this either because like all my blacks and whites are very low because I use them pretty consistently for swatching like toppers over and stuff like that. So I don't count those. So out of all of my polishes, I would say Essie's Chinchilli, Zoya's Jill, and then Studio M's Vintage Vamp. So those are my top three, kind of a weird combination. Okay, I don't like this question. <laughs> How many untrieds do you have? Let's find out. Okay, the number was a lot bigger than I thought. Um, I have a small excuse to give you before I tell you the number, and that is I did buy somebody's full nail polish collection uh, two summers ago at this point. And so that added several hundred polishes to my untried list. Um, yeah, I have uh, 529 untrieds. Um, that's not including stamping polishes. I don't count those in there because I, I just use them infrequently. And some of these polishes, they have been tried or used by me. It's just that that was before I started doing my spreadsheet. I didn't start doing my spreadsheet until 2018. So there was a good two or three years that I was wearing a lot of these polishes and I just didn't. So that number's not perfect, but it's also still going to be really high either way you look at it. Oh, this one's easy. What's the one polish you were expecting not to like but ended up loving? I've talked about this one before, Zoya's Eunice. That was, I was like annoyed when that came out in the holiday collection because I was like, that's just gross. And that was before, that was before my green awakening. Um, and I was just like, I'm so annoyed by this color. It's so ugly. And then I ended up getting it for free in like a Zoya promo. You know how they give away, so they give away so much stuff. I don't know. Their overhead must be insanely small because they're constantly giving away full collections with stuff and like flipper bottles and gel and stuff like that. So, but yeah, they sent that full collection and I was like, God, this color is so ugly. But I wanted to wear it anyways. I don't know why. I, I just put it on and then I was instantly in love. It was like 
a complete 180. I've never done that before with a polish. And I was just like, oh my God, this is my favorite polish. It's, I have another one over here that I'm gonna give to my sister, but it is so gross looking. And because I have a lot of like pink tone in my skin, because I don't know, like I've tried to cover it up with some green color corrector, but like I, there's like a lot of rosacea in my family. And so it really makes my hands look like bright red when I wear this. I don't care, it's, it's wonderful, I love it. So Zoya's Eunice. <laughs> What is your educational and professional background? Um, I went to a four-year university and I got a degree in Japanese language and culture with a minor in teaching English to speakers of other languages. So then after I graduated from college, I joined the JET program, which is the Japanese exchange teaching program. It's a really nice program. It pays really well for what you do. Um, and literally you just go over to Japan and the government sets you up at a school and you just co-teach English and, uh, you don't need a background in teaching for it. I think it's better because you're providing a better experience for the students, but I worked in a Japanese academic high school and I taught English and I ran the English club and then I moved back to the U S and while I was searching for a more professional job, I took a job at a daycare because they had told me that they had a lot of students who were Japanese and they didn't speak a lot of English. So they wanted somebody who could talk to the kids. And I got to the daycare and all the kids were Chinese and the daycare was awful. And so I worked there for like a year. And then I finally found a job in the automotive industry working for a Japanese office. And I did that for, I think two, two years and some change maybe. And then they laid off my entire department due to, who knows, they, they said it wasn't the pandemic, then they said it was, but uh, we all got laid off. And then I just recently, a little over a year ago, found another job in the automotive industry doing something similar. And here we are. If you could collaborate with any brand mainstream, which would it be and why? And then indie. So mainstream, of course, it would be China Glaze because they are my favorite brand, but I would also want to collaborate with Zoya, even though I don't even think they do collaborations and I would make them make my name into a polish. <laughs> and then as far as a uh, indie collaboration goes, I've actually never really thought about that. I think that probably my favorite active indie brand Currently, I think that I would want to collaborate with Jess Face 90 from 90 just because she's also like a local Michigan brand. And I think that would be really cool to collaborate with a more local brand. But I also think it would be cool to collaborate with Bees Knees Lacquer because they are just so insanely innovative. And I think that they would be really good at taking even your like wildest ideas and turning them into a wearable polish. If you could create a nail polish with any inspiration, what would it be? Book, movie, song, etc. You could also let us know brand you'd work with, type of brush you'd want, even what the bottle would look like. This is so hard for me because I don't think that I'm not creative. I mean, like a lot of my hobbies are creative, but they're creative in a way that you, you follow a pattern or you, you follow like rules of the hobby. And so it's like, while I'm not not creative, I don't think I'm very artistic. And so it's kind of tough for me to come up with something like that. I, I guess I like unique shaped bottles. Like I really liked the Harry Styles pleasing bottles. I loved that Dior bottle. I love just a bottle that probably would be more custom to anything you'd see on the market. But again, I couldn't tell you what I want it to look like. Um, I did do a uh, topic Tuesday though. I will link it up top about what I would, if I were to make a collection, what it would be. And I had based it around like a plant theme. So if you want to check that out, that was like my one creative dive into something like that. And I will link that above. Have you ever thought of doing nails as a career or even as a side job? So I get asked this quite a lot in my day-to-day -day life. Um, and I, it's not that I've never thought about it. I think the answer is just that no, I never would. Um, I think that some people are very comfortable monetizing a hobby 
and they can still enjoy it. But for me, I like even with like cross stitch and knitting and things like that, people are always like, you could sell this, you should sell this. And I'm like, yeah, but then I have to do it when I don't want to do it. That's a thing. It's like, I want to be able to pick up my hobbies and do them when I want to, not because I have to. And so I just feel like doing nails all day while it might be fun at first, I think there's just would be days where I'm just like, God, no, I don't want to do this. And I'm also not like nail art inclined. Like I'm not good at nail art, which is more what people are looking for when they're looking for a nail artist. I see so many really talented nail artists and on Instagram. And I think that you'd have to be more comfortable using gels too, because that's typically what people want is like gels and acrylics. They don't really like even though my nails are long and like they kind of if I paint them can look like an acrylic because they're so unnaturally long. I don't think that most people are going to grow their nails out to this length and then want them to just be painted with regular nail polish. So I think it would be fun, but I just have a hard time putting terms to things that are like my hobbies and things that I'm supposed to enjoy because I already... I really struggle in my daily life to relax and enjoy myself. And so I feel like turning a hobby into like money would kind of ruin it for me. And YouTube is a little bit different, I think, because this isn't like a job. I just do it and then I happen to make a few bucks off of, you know, videos here and there. But I don't feel compelled to make a video solely because I think it's going to make me a lot of money. I feel compelled to make videos because I just want to share with you guys my thoughts and stuff like that. If you were restarting your nail journey, what would you do differently? And what advice would you give to a baby nail polish collector? So I actually did have a video on this as well, and I will link that up in the cards. But I think one of the biggest things that I'm even learning now is just if you miss out on something, it's really not that big of a deal. You know, there's, it's hard not to get wrapped up into the hype of something and then feel really disappointed if you didn't get it. But there are so many talented makers out there that you're bound to find something similar. And one thing that I have noticed is I recently went through my nail polish wish list and I like looked up everything that was on my wish list to see like, oh, what is this? Why haven't I bought this yet? And I'm going to say I deleted like half that wish list because I was like, why did I put this on my wish list? So stuff that you think that you love in that moment, it's good to just take a step back and just, if you can, just wait a little bit before you decide to buy it. Because there was like colors on there where I'm just like, I already have this 900 times or I'm like, this is an ugly color. I would never wear it. Or it's like, I don't remember even putting it on my wish list, you know? So if you're someone who is looking to get into like amassing a larger collection like mine and like a lot of YouTubers, I think one of the best things you can do is, you know, take a step back, think about each purchase. Um, and also one thing that has really helped is just swatching your collection out. I have all my swatch rings on my walls. So in theory, if I'm looking at a polish online, I can be like, oh, do I have something similar? Pull down the swatch ring with the corresponding colors and fan it out and see. And I'm gonna be honest, I don't do that so often. I'm like, I just want it, I just want it, and I buy it. But my friend Healer Senjo over on Twitch, she's very good about it, and she will always double check to make sure she's not double buying stuff. Um, I aspire to be that way someday, but I'm not there yet. So even at this point, I still have things to learn. What is your favorite and least favorite kind of nail art to do? Hmm. I really enjoy stamping. I. I was gonna have a really cool stamping mani to show you guys, but then I woke up and my pointer finger was broken and I got some gel on it right now to like hold it in place till I can figure out what to do. Not not thrilled about that. Um, but I really like stamping. I think it's a, a lot easier than you would expect. It is quite messy. Um, I like making decals, but I haven't done much of it. I think it's really a fun and easy way to make something look super intricate, even when it's not. Um, as far as nail arts, I don't like to do. I wouldn't say that I don't like doing it, but like freehand, I just get anxious when I have to do freehand. And it's like, I want to be better at freehand nail polish or nail art, but it's hard and um i i'm impatient about it i think is the biggest problem i need to practice 
thinking that it's not going to take 30. Like, I just go into it. And I'm like, this is going to take me 30 minutes and I'll be done out the door. And it's like, no, I got to remember that like a lot of nail artists on Instagram and stuff, they're like, I worked on this set for three hours. It's not like an instantaneous thing. It's like, it's like my dad used to tell me, Hillary, this isn't going to take five minutes. Okay. This is not a five minute job. And I got to tell myself it's not a five minute job. You got to set aside some time and you got to put in the work. So that would be probably my least favorite. And it's only just because I'm impatient about it. Do you have any pets? Uh, currently, no. Um, I would like to have a pet. I grew up, I had a dog. Her name was Zippy. And she passed away when I was 14. And she was 14. We grew up together. And then after that, my parents got another dog. I didn't, I don't know. She was annoying. Um, and then when I moved out and went to college, I got guinea pigs. And I had a lot of guinea pigs. And then... A couple of them died just from old age and then when I moved to Japan the first time I had to give them away because my family wasn't about to take care of all those guinea pigs. I don't blame them there were a lot but I had a lot of friends who wanted some so they all took them and they lived pretty long lives which was good. Um, my boyfriend is really allergic to cats and when we moved into this apartment they, they clearly didn't vacuum. There's cat hair everywhere. And he came in and his whole head swelled up. It was awful. But he's very anti me getting a hairless cat because he thinks they're creepy. I think he's wrong. Um, so that's right out. I am really interested in getting a bird. And so is my boyfriend. It's just um, I need to do a lot more research. And uh, I think that for me personally, I think it's important when you are going to buy an animal, you make sure that you have like a vet ready to go like you know the nearest vets that will take care of it and especially with a bird like it's a little bit harder so i need to figure out what veterinarians are around that could take care of the bird um i need to build up an emergency fund for the bird in case there are any health effect like defects or like anything that happens to it it gets sick and i need to make sure my apartment will even let me have birds i need to do more research into bird care i know that there's just a lot and I don't want to go into it like half-heartedly. So that's like several months down the road. I got a lot of stuff to look into. What are your top three video games and why? I think I know you like Animal Crossing, but that's about it. You are correct. I love Animal Crossing. <laughs> um, I've been playing it since it was on GameCube. I've had almost every single iteration of it, except for there was like an Amiibo game. I don't have that one. I collect the cards. I collect the Amiibo statues. I just really enjoy it. I got my boyfriend into it, which is hilarious because he only really plays like shooter and horror games. So the fact that I convinced him to try Animal Crossing and now he's obsessed with it, it's like a huge 180 for him. As far as other games go though, I love Stardew Valley. And actually yesterday I got my boyfriend to play that with me and we played for like five hours. And he's like, wow, this is way more fun than I thought it was going to be. So Stardew Valley, for those of you who don't know, is a farming simulator. I love farming simulators, which is so funny because I grew up in a farming village. And the first thing I did when I graduated high school was get as far away from that village as I could. But I love farming games. And then it's, it's hard for me to think of a third one because those are the main two that I play right now. I love just really colorful games in general. I do have on my Switch, I can't even remember the name of it, that I play a lot. Um, and it has just a bunch of Hanjie puzzles on there, which I think in English a lot of people call them like nonograms or Japanese crossword puzzles or something like that. But I play a ton of those games. Um, they're literally just puzzles. So yeah, I, that's just, that's kind of a gimme. But I, I love puzzles. I love like jigsaw puzzles and I just like doing like mental puzzles and stuff too. I think I got that from my dad. Have you lived in any other state besides Michigan? Weirdly, no. I haven't. Um, my boyfriend has lived in like New York City. He's lived in California. He's lived in Las Vegas and like a bunch of places in Michigan. He's moved around a lot. But me, the only two places I've ever lived are the U.S., Michigan, and I've lived in two prefectures in Japan. I lived in Osaka and I lived in um, Shizuoka. When did you get your septum piercing? Tell us about it. Well, the first time I got my septum pierced, I was in college. And then when I 
moved to Japan after college. It fell out when I was in a bathhouse and I didn't know. And then uh, it closed up because there's not like a ton of places that you can easily get like body modification type stuff in Japan. And then um, during my annual midlife crisis last year, I was like, I'm going to get my septum repierced. And my boyfriend was like, okay. And I was like, I'm doing it. And so <laughs> I got it redone. And the, the, the one benefit of everybody wearing masks right now is that nobody questions you when you wear it all the time at work. And so nobody can see it and it was able to heal up. And now I can get one that I can flip up if I ever have to take my mask off at work, but I don't. So, um, but yeah, I used to have a lot more piercings. I had my lip done. I had two here. I had my uh, tongue. I had 10 or 12 in like my both ears combined. I had to take some of them out to make space for my hearing aids. Um, but yeah, I, I love piercings. Uh, the nose, the septum, Oh yeah, I also had my nostril pierced, but the septum piercing, the thing about the septum piercing that hurts is not the needle, it's the clamp. Both times, I gotta say, the clamp is what made my eyes water, not the needle. You can't even feel the needle because the clamp hurts so much. But yeah, it's an easy piercing, heals up pretty fast. I know some people think that they look stupid. I don't care, I wanna look stupid. Hi, Hillary. Um, or is it spelled Hillary with one L? Nope, my name is spelled Hillary with two L's. I want to ask what your favorite books and shows were growing up. Just like the ones that give you cozy and nostalgic feelings. All right, so I already talked about one. It's The X-Files. I The X-Files is 100% my comfort TV show. I would watch it almost every single day, I swear. Um, when I was in middle school and high school if I ever stayed home sick I would we had a five disc DVD changer I would just grab a season of X-Files I would load up five discs and I would just lay on the couch and watch the X-Files all day and like sleep ultimate comfort TV show the other show that I was really into as a kid Invader Zim I was an Invader Zim kid I was a Hot Topic kid I have all the DVDs of Invader Zim still I just am like, I could probably, if you put on an episode of Invader Zim, I could quote it from start to finish. It's annoying that I can do that. And same with Spongebob. Me and my siblings, it everything is a Spongebob reference, I swear. My parents are always just like, when we all get together, they're just like, why are you guys like this? Like, how did we raise three annoying children? As far as books go, I don't know. I mean, I remember reading, I read the Harry Potter series with my dad and I really liked that, but... As an adult, you know, it's like, I'm nostalgic for that time period, but I don't, I, I'm not like one of the Harry Potter adults, you know, I'm not like somebody who's like, I know my house and I collect Harry Potter memorabilia. It's more just like, I miss the times when my dad would buy the books and then we would read them at the same time and we kind of have like a little book club about it. And then when the movies would come out, he would always take us to the IMAX to go see them. That was like a really, really significant memory for me. My dad was really, really good about taking part in our interests and, and doing that sort of stuff. So that's that's one big one. And then I was really into Vonnegut, especially in high school. Kurt Vonnegut was one of my favorite authors. Um, I, I know this is very basic. Like this is like everybody's favorite author is Vonnegut when they're in high school. But Slaughterhouse-Five is to this day my favorite book. It's one of the only books that I keep a hard copy of. Usually I give away a book when I'm done reading it because to me, I don't think that I need to keep them around. They take up a lot of space and I can always go to the library and borrow it if I need to read it again. But Slaughterhouse-Five is one that I keep my original copy of and it like the cover has fallen off. I've had to tape it back on. I've written all over it because that book really helped me deal with death a lot. I had a lot of loss growing up. I lost a lot of family members and friends and just people I was very close to. And there's a phrase in the book, so it goes. I have it <laughs> tattooed on my wrist. It's an old tattoo. It's bad. I got this tattoo when I was 17. Don't look too hard at it. But um, yeah, it, it's just when somebody died, they would say, 
so it goes. Like, this is what happens. But they're still in the meta of the book, you know, or in the in the storyline of the book. They're still alive. It's just in a different plane or, like, a different time period because these aliens... This is going to be so convoluted. These aliens can see you from start to finish. They can see all of time at once. And so even though they stop living here, they're still alive all back here. And, you know, so it goes. That's okay. They're still there. And so for me, that was just... it. It really helped me reshape the way that I thought about losing people and loss. Describe your dream nail polish room or studio space. Man, that is a hard one because like I really enjoy the space I'm in now. The whole reason that we moved into a three bedroom was so that we could each kind of have we had our bedroom together and then we have our own like individual office space and I was so excited to kind of design this space because I haven't had my own space in a while. We lived in like a shoebox one bedroom. I like what I've done. I really love on the walls. I've got my swatch sticks. I've got my drawers and everything, but I wish that I had more displays. If you haven't watched Janixa from Nail Lacquer Therapy, I recommend going and checking out her channel solely just to see her nail room because it's insane. She's got racks on every wall just stuffed with nail polish she's got bookshelves with like tiered um shelving units she's just got like a lot of really cool stuff and i think that while i'm kind of mostly in a really nice space where i want to be i think it would be nicer to have a larger room first of all um some more permanent wall fixtures that i could display some of my favorite polishes and I actually, this is weird, but this was something I was thinking of yesterday. I don't want my computer in my nail room. I don't know what it is. I just, my boyfriend and I, I think I said earlier in the video, we were playing Stardew Valley together and I don't have a microphone. <laughs> I, whenever I do voiceovers for my video, I go and I take his microphone and I use it and then I put it back. Um, but we're just like yelling across the hall about the farm and I don't know, I think it would be kind of nice to have our computers in the same room, which is something that he actually wanted from the get-go. And he was kind of sad that our computers aren't in the same room because he wants to be able to like talk and chat and hang out. Um, and I was pretty adamant. I was like, no, I want my office space. And after yesterday, I don't know, I kind of regretted it. <laughs> I was like, oh, I kind of do want to be in the same room playing games with you. Um, so yeah, I think I would take the computer right out of it and just make this like fully a hobby room. And then I would put more um, wall displays up. And then I do kind of want like more wall art. I say more wall art. I have no wall art. I, I need art for the walls. I want some nice art for the walls. Uh, so yeah, I, I, honestly, I wouldn't change too much. I'm pretty happy with where I'm at right now. I think the only other thing I would add is have some kind of like permanent lighting fixture situation because every time I film, I take all my lighting back down and put it away because there's just not a lot of space and I would also want um, more space like more table space for to have friends over or my sister and we could do our nails together and things like that. If you were forced to get rid of all of your nail polishes and you could only keep three of them what would they be? Oh no. Ugh, that's a tough one. Um, I can't answer that. That's hard. If I was to only pick three, I'm thinking about this two different ways. I'm like, should I go practical or should I go the ones that I love the most? And I think that let's just kill practical. We don't need to be practical. This is an insane situation. So I would keep, this is tough. So I would need one gross green for sure, one purple for sure, and one blue because those are like my three favorite colors to wear. So for the gross green, I would choose... China Glaze Zombie Zest, because that is like the epitome of a gross green. That's like everybody's gross green. For my purple? Hmm. You guys, why would you ask me such a rude question? That's hard. Um, ugh, maybe DRK Light Tricks? I know that's not even in my top 10 purples. Hillary, what the hell? Uh, uh, um, okay, hold on. This question is giving me anxiety. Ooh. Oh, no. Color Club's Lucky Charm would be the purple I had to keep because it's like, it's got multi-chrome glitter and it's scented. So it's like, at least I'm getting like a lot of like fun for my like three polishes. And then the last one, 
what did I say? It would have to be a blue, right? I think I would keep Picture Polish Tiffany because I love Tiffany Blue nail polish. And I think those would be my three. That is a really hard question. That's a, I feel bullied. <laughs> okay, it looks like we got like three left. So what was the most difficult part of starting your YouTube channel? Were you first a blogger or an IGer? What prompted you to begin your channel? Well, like I said, I, I got laid off and I just did it. I don't really know what totally prompted me. I just wanted to do it. Um, the most difficult part for me, I thought it was going to be coming up with content because I, I just feel like, like I post two videos a week and, um, I just thought I was going to run out of ideas so fast, but since half of those videos are topic Tuesday videos and I don't even have to come up with the prompts that really wiped out a lot. And then there was like a lot of stuff coming out that I wanted to review. So it wasn't as hard to come up with content as I thought. I have so much content like is on a list of things I want to do that it's just like, it's going to be there. The most difficult part I think was more the technical side. It was learning how to, which I still not learned, is how to like appropriately light the room, how to edit because I had never edited video before. Like that was something that I had just never, ever thought I would do in my life. I never saw myself making a video. And so my boyfriend is friends with a guy who he loves cameras. He, he, he has a like film quality camera that he rents out for people to use. He knows a lot about um, film and, and computers and, and soft, like a lot of editing softwares and things like that. So he actually reached out to the friend for me and the guy recommended, um, I don't even know what the program is. What is the program? something called DaVinci Resolve. And that's what I use to edit. I know a lot of people use like Final Cut Pro and stuff, but so far I feel like this has been fine. It does everything that I needed to do. Um, and I've slowly learned how to do that as a YouTube, or I could export it as a YouTube style video and then it would upload in 20 minutes. So that was, that was annoying. Um, but yeah, I'm still learning a lot about like lighting and sound and things like that. Sound, I would say like, even though lighting is difficult, I feel like my lighting is somewhat decent. For me, it's sound that is the hardest and will always be the hardest because I am deaf. <laughs> and uh, so a lot of like sound stuff, I just don't pick up on. And so like sound balancing things, it's it's very difficult for me. And then I did actually start on Instagram. It wasn't really anything serious. I just made a separate Instagram for like my nail polish stuff because I felt like people in my life were going to be annoyed. And then um, it just, my YouTube is much bigger than my Instagram, but I do have an Instagram. It's Mediocre Manny's. It's the same handle. If you would be willing to share info about your hearing loss, is it both ears? How much hearing do you have? Did you ever sign? What is the most frustrating part of having a hearing disability? And if you do indeed identify as a person with a disability. P.S. I love your channel. Thank you. So yeah, I, um, I have experienced hearing loss all my life. Um, it was very small at first, uh, but when I was a kid, I'm assuming I was just born this way. My father has it several like one of his or both of his siblings have it um a lot of their aunts and uncles have it uh they told me that a university actually did a study on the family because out of like 11 of the kids a good chunk of them had hearing loss or were deaf so a lot of people don't know this but uh deafness can be hereditary um so i think that i'm just like the one of this generation that got lucky enough to have it. And then I had scarlet fever as a child and that just kind of made things a little bit worse is kind of the assumption. Um, it's both ears. My left ear is worse than my right ear. So when I first got hearing aids, they gave me one. It was in my left ear. And then I felt so <laughs> unbalanced that they ended up next time giving me two. And then the time after that, I got two as well. So I, I wear them in both ears. I'm not wearing them right now because I don't wear them at home. I don't sign, although it's something that I've been looking into learning. I can sign my name and some basic like, you know, like, hi, nice to meet you, like that kind of stuff. 
I do identify as disabled, but I also don't feel like this disability holds me back too much. Uh, the only thing that ever holds me back is other people, to be quite honest. Uh, if I need subtitles, which I do, I need subtitles on everything, some people just don't want to put them on because they annoy them. And the other thing too is a lot of people, and I, I, I understand why this happens, but it's annoying. Um, a lot of people forget or don't really understand the the level of my hearing loss because I speak mostly clearly. Uh, sometimes when I'm relaxed my speech does get a little bit funny um, but that's also just because I'm from the country. <laughs> I am from a very country area and so if I'm not constantly thinking about it, I do have a little twang that slips through and people are like, what? But ultimately, a lot of people, they forget. And so people whisper to me. I can't hear whispers. I can't hear them. People cover their mouths when they speak to me. The, the masks have been very difficult for me, but it's like extra annoying when people are covering their mouths or like looking away when they're speaking to me because I need you to be like directly looking at me. I don't know how much hearing I have specifically. I have not been tested in a while. It's not like my insurance doesn't cover and a lot of insurances don't cover like hearing aids and things like that. So I'm kind of just afraid to go and deal with that. But yeah, like I said, I myself don't feel frustrated um, about losing my hearing. It's something that has gradually happened over my whole life. It's something that I am used to. I have never felt anger at myself or like my body for not hearing. The only frustration I have is when people either don't take me seriously because like when you tell somebody you're deaf but you speak more clearly, they don't believe you. But yeah, I'm, I'm a person who does not really mind questions about my hearing and my hearing loss and things like that. I like to share with people because I just feel like it is such a misrepresented disability in the media or like not everybody even views it as a disability. I should say that as well. It's just a very misrepresented thing in media. And so a lot of people have really inaccurate uh, preconceived notions about it. And so I love to clear those up so that maybe somebody who does not want to clear those up for you, you can be more sensitive to that situation. Okay, last two, sorry. What is your advice for someone starting out in nail polish? Mainstream and indie brands, including nail care, base coats, top coats, cuticle oils, nail polish removers, nail art, favorite toppers, etc. So I think I do have a couple videos on this. I did put like my favorite like non-nail polish videos. I have like favorite base and top coat videos. And I have um, a video where I put together a kit for someone who is a nail polish like newbie as far as like the hobby goes for my sister. And I will link some of those up here, but just real quick, um, mainstream and indie brands, you know, my favorite is China Glaze, but you kind of have to decide if you, if you want like creams or fun finishes. So like you, I would have to recommend based more on that than anything else. Indie brands are hard because there's like a million of them and they're always coming and going. So if you're the person who asked this question, just let me know down below what specifically types of polish you're looking for and I can recommend you lots of brands based on that. Um, as far as nail care goes, I would say the most important thing is just oiling your nails. Right now, my favorite like all around nail oil is the Orly Argan Oil Drops. That one is really nice, but my favorite nail oil of convenience are the cuticle buddy from shop nbm and i will link those down below they're just really convenient to like throw in your pocket or your bag or whatever um favorite base coat orly bonder base my favorite top coat is the glisten and glow uh quick dry top coat i got one over there i'm not gonna grab it but that one is really cheap uh in my opinion and it works really well Let's see. Nail polish removers. I literally just buy a gallon of acetone. Hang on. So I literally go to Sally's and I buy this 128 ounce uh, bottle of acetone. And then I have this. This is a bottle that I bought from Meyer years ago. This was 100% acetone nail polish remover. 
I literally just take a funnel. The funnel is important. Um, I take the funnel and I just, as it runs out, I fill that up and it it's lasted me, like I said, the entire time I've been doing my nails. So it's really convenient. Um, but a lot of people really don't like pure acetone because it is very drying of your skin and your nails. So it's just like the fastest way to take stuff off, honestly. Um, but the other nail polish remover that I do use is Zoya's Remove Plus. This one is more expensive. I don't use this one as often. It is really nice though. It's very gentle. It does not leave your skin as dry. I mean, it's still gonna dry a little bit, but it does take more scrubbing to get the polish off of your nails. However, your nails are not left as like bone brittle dry as with pure acetone. So I keep both of these around. Um, just depending on my mood. My favorite nail art, probably stamping just cause it's such an easy one to do, but you get like a high reward. Like you get some cool designs and people are like, wow, I can't believe you did that yourself. And you're like, yeah, yeah, it was so difficult when really all you did was stamp it on the nail. And it's just, it's, it's messy, but it is fun. And my favorite toppers, I will be coming out with a top 10 toppers video soon. But just as a topper category overall, I like chunky glitters that are shaped like something. Like I have a topper that the, it was from Color Club actually, and the, the glitters are shaped like the ghost emoji. So I love that. Okay, so this is the last question. It's also a bunch of questions at once. So um, were you interested in art and colors when you were a kid or what were your creative outlets? I think I've always been interested in creative stuff. When I was a kid, my favorite toy was like Play-Doh and clay and things like that. And I liked coloring and art and stuff like that. I've I've always loved colors. Like I, I love things that are colorful or are just bright. And it's weird because even though growing up, I was a kid who only wore black, all black, everything. I would not even consider an article, article of clothing if it was not black. I still loved very colorful stuff. And I guess it's just, I think that sometimes it's because like, maybe because I did not hear as well, like things that were more visually stimulating are just nicer for me. And so I really like colorful stuff. What surprised you about starting growing a YouTube channel? I honestly was surprised that anybody was gonna watch, to be quite honest. I have low confidence in myself. I just, every time I do or make something, I'm like, this sucks, so you, you just are bad, you know? And then people are like praising it and I'm like, they're just being nice and it's like, it's fine. And so I was really surprised when I started getting comments and like very early on, I even got like, some people were like emailing me to my uh, mediocre Manny's email and saying like, I really enjoy what you're doing. And, and people were, when I posted my spreadsheet video, people were like, can you give us a copy of it? So I was like, oh, people like the stuff that I'm doing. And then when I initially hit 500 subscribers, I was like, oh my gosh, like I'm actually kind of doing it. And then recently when I hit a thousand, I was like, wow, okay, all right. Um, but actually the biggest surprise for me about like my YouTube channel was kind of like a, I was like a little bit more personal. It's kind of weird. I, I know a lot of people say they hate editing themselves. They really hate editing their videos. They don't like hearing their voice. They don't like looking at themselves. They feel very self-conscious. I love it. I, I think I've found like a new appreciation for myself because I, I pull up my videos and I'm like, gosh, I'm hilarious. And I'm like, wow, I look pretty in this video and things like that. And so that's not something when I look in the mirror, I'm just like, oh, oh God, like really you're, you're here. And that's like one of the main reasons I don't get a haircut is because I don't want to look in the mirror for an hour. But when I'm editing YouTube videos, I'm like, mm, all right, I'm kind of funny. Who is she? Like what's going on? So that was kind of like a surprise for me that I was like gonna learn to like myself more just from like forcing myself to watch like hours of video of myself. It was a weird one. Um, assuming talent, skill, etc., was no boundary, what would your dream job or way to spend your time be? So actually, um, 
if I wasn't working, I would just be doing my hobbies all the time. Like I just love doing hobbies. I enjoy making things and, and not for anybody like to buy. I just like to make things to give to people or make things because I can. It's, it's really cool to put in a lot of time and effort and at the end of it, you've created something. Um, but as far as my dream job goes, this is gonna freak a, a lot of people out. I can already tell. When I was in high school, um, I was torn between two jobs and I was, initially I wanted to be a tr in a translating or interpreting position with Japanese, um, or I wanted to be a mortician because uh, as someone who, like I said earlier in this video, has suffered a lot of loss in their life, I spent a lot of time in funeral homes, I spent a lot of time grieving, and I just think that people don't really realize how significant of a job becoming like a mortician and a funeral home director really is. Like these are people who are, they're guiding you through probably one of the hardest experiences in your life for a lot of people. And I just felt like as someone who has dealt with that and who has gone through a lot of that, I would be a really good candidate for that position. And it was just something that, you know, death and dying, they don't freak me out. I don't get, I, I get sad, right? I, of course, it's, it's a sad thing, but it's like, I don't get completely upset the way I did when I was a child. And I, I understand it. And so I wanted to go to Wayne State uh, school for like they have a like mortuary science division and just due to some like I got a lot of comments in my life that a lot of people were like freaked out by that they were really upset about it they did not like that decision for me and so I did not pursue it any further and at this point I kind of wish I had I really wish that that is what I had done there's a lot of forks in the road in your life and you have to make decisions my job is fine now I just think that I probably would have done a little bit more good in that position. A lot of people were like, oh, you have so much potential to do something so much better. And I just think like, that's the best thing, you know? I think that's an important job. And I think because a lot of people get upset by death or find it very morbid, they they can't understand why somebody might want to pursue something like that. Um, so yeah, that was that would have been my career had I not gone into Japanese language. If you had to describe your style, clothes, decor, however you want to define, what would it be? And how do your manicures and nail art mesh with that style? Well, I like things that are ugly. I like things that clash. I like things that are obnoxious. That's my style, ugly and obnoxious. And I think that with my nails, I pick a lot of obnoxious colors. I pick a lot of colors that I think a lot of people would think were ugly in the bottle. Um, so yeah. I just love things that look like they're gonna hurt your eyes to look at. You know what I mean? So yeah, I think that was all the questions. If you had a question that didn't get answered, I must have just missed it. So just like repost it down and I will answer it for you. Um, or if you have any additional questions or want me to extrapolate, let me know. I'd be happy to do so. We all, you know, I love talking about myself. So uh, yeah, but Thank you guys so much for asking your questions. I hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye.